So the topic assigned for today is affordability of insulin. Is it a privilege or is it a necessity? It's taking a minute to open the file. Yeah. Can you see the slides, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. Please. Okay. Slides are seen. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the first topic is affordability of insulin. Is it a right or is it a privilege? Now, uh, is diabetes costly? Yes, it is a costly disease. And I think for this August audience to sit and harp about the cost of diabetes is something. I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. Can you put it on full screen mode, slides mode? It's yes. okay. 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 <laughs> So yes, the health expenditure is going to be a whopping 802 billion in 2045. And the cost of diabetes per se is not so much the treatment per se, a major cost, even if uh, if you look at the data from Vijay Vishwanathan, the cost of therapy is not so much an issue, but the cost of treating the complications of diabetes is much more. Uh, well, 34% of the adult income with diabetes management goes into diabetes management. And if the complications are there, in a 20,000 family which, which earns about 20,000 a month, treating diabetes takes about roughly around five to 6,000 rupees with the newer drugs. And the cost of complications could probably take up the whole of that income of that middle class family. So I think, yes, insulin is a lifesaver. And at some point of time, we know the data from the UK PDS and multiple other studies is that insulin is a lifesaver. It is a lifesaver, especially for type 1. In pregnancy diabetes, I cannot but tell you that the importance of insulin, the affordability is an important issue, not only in this part of the world, but in many other parts of the world. It's a big surprise if you read these slides. The inventor of insulin, today we are into 100 years of insulin. Banting gave that I don't want a patent and he sold the patent to the University of Toronto for a single dollar. But unfortunately, the pharma market has tried to make a kill out of it. They keep saying this is the cost of, you know, doing clinical trials and doing RCTs, everything. But still, uh, I should thank Messrs. Wokat for bringing down the cost of insulin for the common man and that too of a basal insulin, which is so important for us today. Uh, the, co the cost of uh, Poor con the cause for poor control in diabetes is mainly because people don't have the money to buy insulin. The uh, newer basal insulins that have come in are definitely good, I wouldn't say, but it's out of reach of most of the middle class or the middle, middle and the lower middle class income patients. So many people, you know, if you look at the data from JAMA and ADA showing one out of four patients who are treated on insulin drop out of insulin therapy only because of the cost that is involved. <clears throat> and if you look at um, data again in the JAMA 2019 says that poor glycemic control was mainly because of the cost. This is not surprising to all of us who have assembled here because we do see withdrawal from insulin, withdrawal from oral anti-diabetic agents only because of the cost and I'm extremely happy today that we have SGLT2 inhibitors and the DPP4 inhibitors plus a low cost insulin which makes uh, glycemic control pretty easy but unfortunately being a part of the landmark trial still the national average of diabetes control is only about 8.4. We could definitely do much better with the advent of lower cost drugs and lower cost insulin. Right. So the uh, because of this, there is more morbidity and mortality. We know all this. Look at the National Health and Wellness Survey of about close to about 1,200 patients with type 2 diabetes, showing that a one-point drop in self-reported medication adherence. That means what they are trying to say is that if and they reduce the, the A1C becomes worse by about 1%. That means you have you have a greater, I mean, one, you have a greater uh, risk of uh, ER visits, greater risk of being hospitalized. The same thing is echoed in the diabetes care, a very old study, 15,900 and 84 patients. So if you don't keep your sugars under control, and by control, we mean about roughly an A1C of 7%. Uh, the hazards ratio is actually one and a half times because of medication non-adherence. It's data from the UKPDS often repeated, 
every 1% reduction in um, HbA1c reduces not only the diabetes related as macro microvascular complications by 33% we all know but today we know if we hit early we hit hard then the risk of myocardial infarction is also down by 16% and amputation down by around 45% of course the point that i would like to make here is that the amputation rate is pretty still high in our country only because we do not emphasize on foot care and footwear to our patients that's the sad part right the same thing has been echoed in the form of a tabular column again a commonly spoken about slide the dcct echoed the same statement showing that if you have good control the risk of all the microvascular complications is definitely less we've seen it in our diabetic individuals type 1 as well as type 2 so high cost leads to poor adherence more of dropouts more dropouts more complications as a reduction in the quality of life we are not really bothered about the life span of an individual who's sitting in front of me but even if he lives for about a year i would like to give him a good quality of life and that is marred because of cost of therapy now look at the global concern here this is very sad Americans go to Canada where it is 90% cheaper. This is the status in an in a in a country which is, uh, you know, is, is supposed to be one of the leaders in the GDP. They cross the the Americans cross the border into Mexico to buy insulin uh, at a fraction of the U.S. cost. That's sad. And look at that. That's more gruesome. This is again an article by somebody which is out in the public domain in the media saying that I should not have buried my son at 26 because he couldn't afford insulin. That's really sad. It's really very sad that someone has been denied therapy because of expense and. Uh, that's the bad thing. I mean, whether it's Israel, Italy, Greece, Germany, Taiwan, or Canada, everywhere the same economics seems to play an important part. And I shudder to think what would be the situation. Uh, I live in a tertiary care center and I go to one of the most elite hospitals in the city. So what happens is uh, even here we find patients complaining to us of, uh, of the exorbitant cost and we are now moving in from multinational brands to these Indian brands in many of our drugs. Look at this. Uh, it's really very, very gruesome. I wouldn't like to dwell on these particular slides. They're pretty heart rending. So, and this sad part here is that um, the cost of insulin has gone up for many of the uh, many of these insulins only because there's an increment in the uh, the uh, customs duty. I think we need to make a lobby and represent to the government of India that GST must be abolished. The uh, there was no sales tax on insulin in the in the state of Tamil Nadu, but after GST has come in, there is a four to five percent GST on insulin. I think the government can well put uh, you know reduce the cost of at least basal insulin and these uh, older uh, human premixed insulins because that seems to be something which is very important for the common man. Now, the cost of insulin here the, would be uh, a human analog is roughly around 2 rupees 50 paise per unit, whereas human insulin is roughly around 40 paise. So uh, on the one side, we talk about lower risk of nocturnal hypoglycemia, lower risk of overall hypoglycemia. And on this side, we find that this becomes out of reach of the common man. The innovator insulin also started off with 500 rupees for a pen fill. Today, it is close to around 850 to 900 rupees. Very insidiously the cost of insulin has gone up and they cite reasons like customs etc etc look at the, the world health organization uh, is position statement i could say it, saying that insulin access and affordability the lowest price insulin should be given thankfully today even the us has woken up and spoken about interchangeability of insulins and uh, our own or another indian manufacturer has got the labeling for interchangeability of their uh, of their their uh, uh, glargine, you know, the biosimilar glargine. So I think we need to really look at the patient's pocket as well. In Colorado is the only state in, uh, in the U.S. which capped the price of insulin. I think that should be done even in this part of the world. Now, what are biosimilar insulins? There's been a big brouhaha about the efficacy, the safety about biosimilar insulins. So what we have to know is that, well, are they safe? Are they equally immunogenic or are they more immunogenic? These are the two important points that we need to say. If you look at outcomes, well, we find we have similar equivocal reduction how do we get to know this? One is in our clinical practice, but what does the data tell you? A lot of bioequivalent studies and 
PKPD studies have been done comparing the biosimilar insulins with the innovator Glargine. And what they found is that, that biosimilars have revolutionized treatment. They're equivocally good. The next important issue that I would like to know as a clinician is that, is it immunogenic? Because a systematic uh, review of 11 RCT uh, showed a similar efficacy. And look at the most important point is the safety immunogenicity between biosimilar and the other originator insulins. So I think the biosimilar insulins have come to stay. Look at a small study from our own part by SK Sharma, uh, looking at the uh, efficacy and safety of the Vocats biosimilar in insulin glargine over the reference innovator glargine in type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> then it, it, we, the, it was a open label randomized trial looking at, uh, you know, uh, and Glarit is given uh, either once daily or, or the other innovator Glargine once daily for six months subcutaneously. And what did they find? The most important point over here is that look at the the blue lines and the and the and the red bars. The red bar shows that when you changed the 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 anti-insulin antibody titers are definitely much lower when you use glaritus in comparison to the originator. Well, this is a little difficult to digest, but nevertheless, the point that I need to make and tell you here is that they are pretty safe and you don't really have to worry about the immunogenicity and, uh, and the fallout that comes with the antigen antibody complex binding and its dissociation in a patient who inadvertently receives a steroid from a primary care physician for for an for a acute attack of uh, bronchial asthma, and then there is acute hypoglycemia. These are things which you used to see years ago when we used animal insulins. They are no longer seen today. So here, immunogenicity is not an issue. So I think they're pretty safe. Uh, it confirmed uh, the safety, which was quite equivocal to the uh, innovator glargine. So I think if you, uh, the point I also need to make over here is that uh, rather than harping about the biosimilar insulins and the, and the cost that they bring, now Vocat has brought out, uh, uh, you know, a pack, a pack of three where the patient pays for two, wire, two pen fills and he gets the third one free. All that's fine. Let's, as clinicians, move beyond economics also and say, how do you reduce the burden, economic burden of insulin? It's simple. We need to start insulin pretty early. I'm sure all the August audience here would agree with me that the faster you start insulin in an individual, that to basal insulin, the amount of the, the rate of beta cell apoptosis is definitely going to be halted because of an elevation in glucolipotoxicity and the quantity of insulin that will be given in order to keep good glycemic control. And I'm, we all know that they only bring down the fasting plasma glucose and the quantum of insulin that is required to suppress the hepatic glucose output is minimal, but the amount of insulin that's required to improve peripheral glucose uptake is definitely higher. So the point here is that you need to bring down the fasting plasma glucose by starting this pretty early. And I've had a large number of patients, many of you would agree with just about less than 20 units of insulin and they had very good control of fasting plasma glucose. And we added the oral anti-diabetic agents. Today we have the newer oral anti-diabetic agents with the least risk of hypoglycemia. We added them and we are, I'm able to, my, my office average and Apollo average is open to auditors anywhere between 7 to 7.5. So it's very easy to get the blood glucose down if we start insulin early and the quantum of insulin and it is less. Obviously, a person who requires 10 units of insulin per day is going to have to require only one refill of the uh, biosimilar glargine from Vokar, which costs close to about uh, 400 and odd rupees compared to someone who requires something like 30 to 40 units per day. His requirement will be four times larger. So I think the catch is not only in, in taking an insulin, which is less expensive, but it is also in starting it pretty early. That is what I was taught to uh, by my teacher, Professor Sam G. P. Moses. So I think the uh, insulin must be made more affordable, much more available. Forget whatever, um, uh, you know, uh, star wars that happened by the pharma industry. I think it's a laudable issue that the Indian pharma giants have started reducing the cost of insulin and interchangeability has come in of one of the brands. So I think that's a great thing. But once again, I sign off with the plea stating that you need to actually um, 
start it early in order to keep down the cost of insulin, the cost of therapy, and retain the beta cell. And the fast you you hit early, you hit hard, you have fewer complications, and you'll find that over 20 years your patients will come. I've been practicing for the last two and a half decades, and you get your patients coming and telling you that that my neighbor went in for an amputation, went in for an MI, and I'm quite all right. So I think we need to move on to that hit early, hit hard. We all talk about it, but some of the primary care physicians still don't do that. And I think we need to outreach and make motivate them to change. I sign off here and thank you so much for the patient hearing. If there's anything, I would be happy to answer.